That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Janet Jackson, period. The new two part. <laughs> that's the this the new part two part documentary uh, that premiered uh, as a two night special event on Lifetime, January twenty eighth and 29th, ninth, twenty twenty two. Uh, directed by Benjamin Hirsch, uh, a documentary crew followed Janet purportedly for five years since twenty seventeen, uh, and at long last, uh, her crafting the story of her life and uh, spilling all the tea supposedly. Uh, was unveiled the second part was unveiled this evening all right i feel like we had to review this because i'm such a huge janet fan um well documented mm-hmm. tattoos records everywhere posters <clears throat> everywhere i've loved her since 1987 so i was very excited to see it mm-hmm. <clears throat> yes anticipation has been quite high <laughs> am i disappointed mm. I think for someone like me, there wasn't much I didn't already know. But knowing Janet as a fan, I know she's very private. I didn't expect her to drop bombs and be super candid. So she did sort of deliver what I would expect from her. Sure. I I think I was expecting more. Yes, Um, of course. Especially as pertaining to more uh, dramatic, well-documented moments in her life. But, you know, to me, the biggest fault of this documentary is if you cut out all the commercial breaks, it'd be about 90 minutes. There were so many damn <coughs> commercials, my goodness. Okay, uh, well, really, so we don't know the director very well, right? Benjamin Hirsch uh, has done a lot of television work. Uh, last year, he had a uh, television documentary, uh, Bruno v. Tyson, about the rivalry between Frank Bruno and Mike Tyson. Uh, so things along the lines of that. So Janet, the Janet Jackson doc kind of sticks out in his filmography. The structure of the documentary is very basic. Um, the editing is very interesting. Um, on some platforms, it looks like there are eight episodes. The one you were referencing, like IMDb, that says there are four. Um, but there's no distinction watching it, except that for one night there was two hours, and then the next night there were two hours. Um, but the basic is just like from the time she was born in Gary, Indiana, and then quickly moved to Los Angeles when, at a very young age when her brothers, the Jackson Five, became super, super famous. We get a lot of time spent with that. Then her sort of joining the family in entertainment at the age of seven, mm-hmm. being on television shows like Good Times and Fame. Then her father making her record music after he hears her. In their family home, there was a recording studio, and one day she lays down vocals, and he happens to get a hold of them and decides, you're going to sing as well. So she records her first two albums, which are kind of flops, and that's when she decides at the age of 18 to break away from her dad, like fire him as manager. It's also during that time she gets married to James DeBarge. Secretly. Secretly, and then annuls it. But uh, that's when she goes off to Minneapolis and records Control, and the rest is history. So then, of course, we get sort of the control era, Rhythm Nation, Janet. When we hit the Velvet Rope, it's more about her relationship with her second husband, Renee Elizondo. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, And then we sort of skip to... Jermaine Dupri. Well, then within that, we get her and and her brother Michael's, uh, like child abuse allegations and how that affected her, the recording of Scream, her meeting Jermaine Dupri. And then we skip to the Super Bowl. And then we get a little bit on that. And then we basically skip like 14 years to like 2020, 2017, 2018. And then her sort of reflecting on her life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And her having a baby at 50. We get no mention of her most recent husband, the one who she has the baby with. Or the dissolution of that marriage. Or we don't see the baby. We just hear her say she's so happy to have it. And that's it. It. Him. No, I mean, that's it oh, for the okay. documentary. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, not the baby. Um, and then the, her final words are, for the future, she wants to focus on being a mother, and but wants to go out with a bang. But then you brought up a good point that she's saying that in like a 2017 interview. Yeah. yeah. So uh, who knows what she's talking about. The end credits... The end credits do feature a new song called Love I Love, mm-hmm. which I would assume is from the black diamond cd though or lp that was supposed to come out so yeah am i disappointed in it no because knowing her as a being such a huge fan i expect her to be very private i didn't expect her to drop bombs i was expecting a little bit more than what we got 
I was expecting more, uh, you know, because they start out asking her, why now? And she said, because it had to be done. Uh, you know, this is her taking control of her story, you know, if you will. Uh, this is a story about control. But yeah. then but then has a lot of, um, glosses over a lot of things. She simply, it's like she recuses herself even from her own memories. Uh, That's a good point because most of the, most of what we hear, you know, she and her brother executive produced this. So obviously had a lot of control over what is being said. But yes, she's recusing herself because she has, I mean, there is a range of people in this documentary. I'm just going to read them off. We have Al Sharpton. Oh, interestingly, we don't have all of her family, no. which would be impossible because there's so many of them. But we're missing some key people LaToya. like LaToya. Although, you know, so Rebe speaks a lot for the family, familial yes. memories. And I have to say, she I thought she looked fantastic. Oh, yeah. Rebe looks great. But we have uh, Tito, Randy, the mother, Catherine, of course, Rebe. We have Questlove, Lee Daniels, Whoopi Goldberg, Norman Lear, Debbie Allen, of course, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Paula Abdul speaks quite a bit. Missy Elliott, Q-Tip, Samuel Jackson, Regina King, uh, her old choreographer, Tina Landon, Sierra, Tiana Taylor, Mariah Carey, Jermaine Dupri, Barry Bonds, MC Light. There are a lot of people in this documentary. Barry Bonds, like, speaking about himself in the third person. Yeah, that was awkward. Was weird. But um, they're all sort of telling her story for her. Yes. So I think that's a very good point that she seems like she doesn't want to... And then you could... The director, she, Ben, she keeps referring to him, is interviewing her. And there are two, at least two times where she's like, I'm done. I don't want to talk about this anymore. And it's like, well, you hired him. To... Also, the organization of some of her thoughts, particularly regarding her relationships with Jermaine Dupri and Renee Elizondo, it's sort of broken up in a way like it's almost like she didn't want her words strung together to tell the full story. So it's very... <laughs> It's interesting. It's strategic. It, it it is strategic, and I and I do appreciate that her, about her. But again, to she doesn't have to say anything at all. Like we, I, I it just feels very curious about. Okay, m maybe this should have been saved for a memoir at the end of your life. That's a little more explicit. If you want to share those things, you certainly don't have to. But... I agree. I think this lady doesn't owe us anything. Yeah. She's given such an enormous body of work, like so much music, so many hits the movies, the tours, the damn book. Like, there, there's, there's just so much she's given that I don't think she owes us anything. She certainly doesn't have to explain herself because she wasn't selling her as an, a person. She was selling her music. So I appreciate that she did this. I'm, as a completist, uh, when I'm interested in any artist, I think I would have liked to see an hour, an hour episode devoted maybe to the crafting of each album. Because she has That's such a... What, okay. Like, and, we, and you could stick to talking about the work and there'd be more than enough and in interesting things. And you could tie in some things as well. This had... You know, Demita Joe was a flop because of uh, the Super Bowl. But then it's like she had... like. Discipline. I, why can't we talk about that album? I don't know. We just skip over Yeah, we so don't talk things. about... Um, or for Colored Girls, we skip over that. Yeah, we do talk... Well, I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself, but since you mentioned it, I do think what I would have preferred... it Because she's not going to talk candidly about sort of the personal things that many of us are curious about, like her relationships and her sexuality. And I, I think this could have been multi episodes or multiple episodes revolving around each era, each project. And then like her childhood, maybe an episode on relationships, motherhood, uh, her as a businesswoman. I also really, I, I really wanted to see more about how she lives her life. Like not her personal business and her feelings, but just like, where do you live? What kind of like, what is your home decorated like? Do you drive? Like, do you like driving? What What was your first car? And we don't really get any sense of who she is as a person, like, day to day, which I think is funny because in the documentary towards the end, they say that this is, people are going to see the real her. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I think we, we see, she's, pre she's very good at presenting an image. Yes, well, and, and, and a demeanor, and like she maintains that in this documentary. Well, she's been trained since a seven year old yeah. to do that. But again, you know, the significant weight issues that she's spoken to at length in other, you know, she had that book she published a few yeah. years ago. Uh, I think she addressed it more uh, pointedly and poignantly there, and that really doesn't come up at all except for kind of the same story she always tells about how she had to bind her breasts as a child on good times, and that's what's what started that cycle of. Um, self-worth issues and 
it, you know, those are all part and parcel of Janet Jackson. And it just feels really incomplete. And there are a lot of like gray areas. I mean, do you want to talk about the Super Bowl? <laughs> How that's addressed. <laughs> we'll get to that. Okay. I'm just gonna. I just want to run through okay. these so I don't uh, take up too much time. Uh, she does talk about her dad quite a bit, and she says like he was strict and he was a disciplinarian, but without that, they wouldn't be where they are. So she says she loves him, and she's so glad that she was able to tell him before he got too sick how much she appreciates him. And then she says, "Discipline without love is tyranny, and tyrants they were not." And I, you know. I, I think it's so funny how people want to put shit on you. Like, you know, for all of her career, all of Michael's career, like people would say like your dad was so abusive to you. And it's like, well, he was strict and he did discipline us, but like we needed it. So like this lady is saying she's fine with it. So I feel like we should just drop it, you know, but we should just drop it. But again, her perspective, you know, she came at a much different time in that family. And I think that she was very critical about uh, a moment where M Michael was approached to reconnect with his brothers for like a reunion and how Michael kind of declined that. And she was very. Oh, she, I didn't know that either, that she even says that because it was during a time like after the allegations where he was not in a good place and he was living in Vegas and had all these people around him who she says were sort of keeping him from everyone so that they couldn't get to him. And she she says, which I didn't know, that she offered to open for him. Mm -hmm. And this was in the later part of the 90s, mm -hmm. which would have been pretty major. Yeah. And he didn't want to do that. Which says to me that, the, you know, her experience within the family unit is probably different from what the rest of them went through, the boys and the, the potential uh, discipline you know, was maybe a little more traumatic, but who knows? And she, do we need to know? In the beginning, when she goes to the family house, because she has no recollection of it, like you mentioned, the way she's looking at everything, she has a look on her face like, ooh, I'm so glad I didn't have to be poor. <laughs> yeah, she missed that stage. Yeah, because she's like, we slept in here, like all these people in this one room. <laughs> I was like looking at old pictures of the family, though, because Latoya looks so fantastically different. Oh yeah, she's an entirely different person. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but it was very beautiful. But it's it's just very interesting. Randy tells a story about how when they first moved to L.A. and of course they were already super famous by then, and so they would have these huge parties at the house and all. Like anyone who was anyone was there. And for some reason, he chooses to tell a specific story about how one party David Bowie showed up, and I guess wanted to sort of be away from everyone so he was kind of walking through this big house and found a room and Michael and Randy as kids were in this room and David Bowie walks in and offers them drugs I thought that was a really odd like Randy Jackson must have a million stories yeah. about every celebrity during that era and it's like that's the story you tell okay <laughs> yeah that uh, was interesting uh, what else do I have oh she does I don't think I've ever heard her be so clear about the fact that she married James DeBarge as a way to, like, be independent of her dad. Mm -hmm. Like, she thought, if I marry this man and I'm someone's wife, I can get away from him. But then, of course, she talks about how he had a drug problem and she just couldn't take it anymore, but she really did care for him. Oh, going back to, sorry, it, I forgot about the uh, Encino house because there were no other black people that lived oh, there. Oh, that's right. I didn't know that there was a, a, petition. a petition to... That, that these these white people wanted them out of there. Can you imagine? Oh, the, you, and it's the Jacksons. And it's the fucking Jacksons. Like, y'all so racist that you don't even want the Jacksons on but, your block? But it's very, you know, <laughs> Raisin in the Sun. That's that's what that, that, that play is all about. But We do get some time about, well, the director asks her pointedly, I believe, like, do you have a child? A secret child. A secret yeah. child. So there is a segment about her having the secret baby, and then her, and she says... She doesn't say no. She says, I would never keep, keep a child away from its father. <laughs> Rebe says she doesn't. No, Re Rebe doesn't say either. She just says that it was so hurtful because they, you know, like, she would never do that. And then Janet says, like, as time went on, they would say, like, certain nieces and or certain nieces were her secret child. But... I don't recall her actually saying, like, I don't. No, she wasn't that pointed. <laughs> like, she could have been very clear to say, absolutely, absolutely, but she does not say that. In fact, you have, like, basically, 
dependent upon the word of Debbie Allen, who was filming Fame with her at the time, That's saying right. like, "There's no way that." But like we were around her all the time. We never saw a baby or yeah, her pregnant. Were, yeah. she, no, she doesn't say she wasn't pregnant. So this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, and I don't have nothing to substantiate this except that I'm wondering if she did become pregnant and terminated the pregnancy, but had been like was showing at some point. So there was a rumor, and then. Oh yeah, well, because she said she was on birth control and that made her gain weight. Which, and, because, uh, and that precipitated people thinking she was pregnant. But then, you know, Debbie Allen also says, like, how could she have had a baby when she was always here? Mm-hmm. But she doesn't say, like, she wasn't pregnant. So I don't know. It's a, it's such a weird thing that get, that has been attached to her. It is, but she yeah. does address it. Janet does talk about how her relationship with Michael changed when Thriller came out. Mm-hmm. and that, that he started to change. He started to change. And, and she attributes that to just, just his um, celebrity, like, skyrocketing. Okay, the best parts of the documentary are we're told that her second husband, Rene Elizondo, who they say worked in film, but he really didn't. He just liked to hold a camera and then directed some of her videos, but he recorded everything. And the documentary says we've never seen this footage. So we actually get a lot of footage that I've never seen Mm -hmm. about her, like behind the scenes in her personal life. Um, So we get stuff about... Well, we get, well, we see sort of a, a confrontation in the studio she has with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis while they're recording songs for Rhythm Nation. I thought that was really interesting. And I think that's the part, the best part of the documentary are those moments because we also get, we get the video of Renee proposing to Janet on the mm-hmm. beach. We also, I, I think the best clip of this four hour thing is when Janet goes to New York to write Scream, the song she did with her brother Michael. And we see her in Michael's New York apartment, like sitting on the bed on her old school laptop, typing lyrics and they're singing and harmonizing. And he's telling her, you got to sing harder. And and then we see her in the studio recording it and her him telling her, like, you didn't quite get that right. And he sounds amazing. I, that's what I wanted. I don't need, this lady doesn't need to spill, like, she doesn't need to, like, tell all her business and be so vulnerable. It's just, like, you know, people are so hungry for, like, a little bit extra, and I feel like she's in control of what she gives. Mm-hmm. I, it's just it's interesting what she chose to highlight and what, highlight and what she didn't. Um, the end of the first part is Rhythm Nation mm-hmm. and the success of that album and how she still holds the record for having the most successful um, debut tour debut tour in history. So that was really cool. And I thought that footage and that, um, all of that information I thought was really fun. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I wish the documentary would have spent more time on just highlighting all her accomplishments and, and just how successful she was. Because, well, let's finish the second part. So the second part starts with her after Rhythm Nation she signs a contract with Virgin Records, which makes her the highest paid recording artist in history. And then as soon as she signs that contract, she goes to shoot Poetic Justice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we start talking about her image changing and becoming more sexual. And then it's right out. And so we don't get a lot of the Janet album, which is interesting mm-hmm. because that album was so huge. Yeah. And really, the only thing we talk about it is Renee and how he was kind of controlling her and um, how her image changed. In the Rolling Stone cover. And the Rolling Stone cover. And then we jump into Michael Jackson's allegations, the first allegations, and how that really affected her career. Another thing I didn't know, be- well, I didn't know that she was on the verge of signing a big contract with Coca-Cola and then right before she was supposed to sign it, the Michael Jackson stuff happened and they told her no. But I was confused because she does have a commercial. Was, oh, wasn't that in Japan? You know what? I think it's a Pepsi commercial. Oh. Is it with the one with Ricky Martin? Oh, I don't remember. So maybe I am confused. But anyway, I didn't know that. Um, she does say, like, she never thought Michael was guilty. So she does say that straight away. Um she she well, talks about the filming of the screen video and laments the fact that she only agreed to do it because she wanted to help him. And then we have other people in the documentary saying that at that time she was like at the peak of her career, couldn't have been more popular. So she thought that at this point she could lend her brother 
um, some juice. So and she, she and she says that the family rallied behind him, and you get footage of Marlon like saying that they support their brother. But I recall clearly as a kid in the 90s, remember, remember hearing that Latoya was saying things that were contrary. No, that was, that was early on talking about the abuse. And she wrote that book. That's right. She wrote that and book. And then much, much later, she said that she kind of questioned it. But during that period in the mid-90s, she was part of like the family. Okay. It, but we don't hear from her at all. No. But Janet does say that she, um, during the filming of Scream, she was really hoping that it could be like old times, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, like she says, old times had long passed. Mm -hmm. So that made me feel kind of sad that she was so disconnected from her brother, mm -hmm. who she keeps saying she was so close to. Um, then she... She is asked, like, why did you, you know, well, she left James DeBarge because of his drug use. Then Renee, she left because she says he was addicted to painkillers. And was controlling. And was controlling. And then we get Jermaine Dupree. And she says she left Jermaine Dupree because um, she found out he was cheating on her and that he never had time for her. So I thought that was interesting. Um, we do hear... Randy tell Janet that Justin Timberlake's team has reached out and wants to include you in his Super Bowl performance back in like 2018 I think mm -hmm. and she says she doesn't want to do it like she thinks of, she thought about it and she, she it could be interesting but it, ultimately she felt like it was revisiting something that didn't need to be revisited and of course she didn't do it but I find that interesting because then we get footage of her in 2022, mm -hmm. so very recent footage of her saying that she and Justin are friends and that, you know, they've talked about it and they've moved on. I thought that seemed very forced. It did. It Well, it, it felt very much like this is the last thing I'm going to say about it and that's it. Um, you mentioned the, talking about the Super Bowl, so we can talk about it now. Just sticking to the, what she's always said, that it was an accident. Uh, that it wasn't meant to happen when so much that, that other documentary just came out last month that kind of suggests otherwise. That she did. And you know, we're, that doc, you know, the other documentary doesn't ask her, so it's like, do we believe the person involved or do we believe people, whatever? We, we may never know the truth. I don't ever expect her to straight up say, like, yeah, I pulled a stunt. I think someone at her level, it, it's probably best to stick with a story that they always... Yeah, I agree. ...that they always originated, because then what does that look like? And people are going to question everything else she's saying. So, I mean, th that's fine, but she doesn't even have to address it at all. And if we go back to it, really, it's like... A, it was a nipple yeah. on a, a television. Like Tyler Perry says, it was a fucking nipple. Like, let's... Tyler Perry's on the thing talking about her as an actor and like how great she is and how wonderful she is. And another thing I wanted to note, because I have been a little bit obsessed with all the promos for the documentary, there's a lot of footage that is in the promos that's not in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Like Tyler Perry talking about how he's had a lot of crushes on Hollywood women and like how they always disappoint him, but Janet didn't. Like, girl. <laughs> When are you going to stop? Um, we get Michael's death, which she doesn't really talk about at all. No, she. It, it's clear that there are things she doesn't. She she just really wants to skirt around. She doesn't want to talk about she it. She doesn't talk about her dad dying. It, it's mentioned, but she doesn't really say much about it. Then we see her getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and what that means to her, which really amounts to her acceptance speech. <laughs> like, they just replay yes. that. Um that's it. That's all I have. I think that if I, you know, if I were a child watching this randomly today, I, I really wouldn't get a sense. If I'd never heard the name Janet Jackson, I wouldn't get a sense of her accomplishments and kind of the, uh, kind of her, her importance in the zeitgeist. Um, I agree, and I feel that way about. I, I feel similar, to, similarly to how I felt about T, the Tina Turner documentary, I Tina, like. That lady, I, I know it was on her terms and she wanted to set the record straight, but part of me just wanted her to really like, like just brag, like how, what, like what a legend and all her accomplishments. And Janet, it just like, like you said, if someone didn't really know her, if some 16 year old who's watching it with their older auntie, 
like they would leave not understanding her impact and how successful she is. And then I kind of wish it would like, because she's still active in the industry, I almost wish they would have done a thing where they compare the numbers she did to like how we look at numbers today. And, and just really understanding like how huge <laughs> she yeah. was for like a decade mm -hmm. that you can't really compare like, you know, yeah, there are popular artists, but whatever little Dua Lipa's doing or Taylor Swift, like these things don't translate. No, not at all. To the the success someone like her or a Madonna, you know, there are many, there aren't many, but there are superstars on that level. And I just don't think the documentary, but again, it's her doing. So maybe she wants to be humble and maybe she just wanted to give this as like a little morsel of her life and... I think that it'd be wiser, you know, like Eartha Kitt did and had several memoirs reflecting different periods of her life, like, to me, you know, would make more sense because there, there's really so much. It's it's overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, the amount of things that Janet's accomplished and has happened to her and her family. And, you know, it, it's fascinating, but it, it is it is overwhelming. Yeah. What would you give it this? Um, I think three out of five. I think it's for casual fans. Which would be like the lifetime audience. Yes. I think like women, maybe like 40, 40 plus, who probably were fans of Janet at her peak, but then of course kind of just casually fell off. I, I think it would appeal to them. We don't even really, like the impact of Together Again, which I think is her biggest hit. They like, do say, so Janelle Monet mentions like that she, you know, sort of gave awareness to HIV and AIDS. And I think that, I mean, that's the song she's talking yes. about. But yeah, I mean, it's like, we don't talk about her biggest hits. We don't talk. <laughs> but, and then even the way they show her stats is very like um, discreet. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm assuming that it's Janet trying to be humble and... I did think Rebe, um had some shade in there with some of her comments. Towards? Towards about speaking about her sister. Like how? Just like talking about that Rolling Stone cover and like we weren't brought up that way and this is not for me but it's my sister like just if you go back and watch it again I think that there's certain things she says and I'm like that's mean catty but okay but I would recommend it I think people should watch it hopefully it'll reignite some popularity so we can get her back out here doing well she's something. working on an album she is but you know back I want her in another movie well back I remember back in 2010 she signed uh, uh, something for something with Lionsgate to direct or develop a film a project and that never director for colored girls but that didn't happen but i think she will again this kid's just gotta get older yeah oh i guess lastly i have to comment on i didn't love the way the documentary was shot like her talking mm -hmm. i just think the lighting was interesting the camera angles weren't very flattering and it's confusing to me because on social media she's glammed up like she clearly knows like the right angles and the lighting and how to do her makeup but in this documentary it's i don't know her palette looks really odd she's very matte her lips are overdrawn her yeah. it's, it's just really interesting like she's looked better more recently so i don't know how i think that it's maybe pandemic related that interrupted a lot of probably structuring this and like really following her around because you know for a year she didn't do anything no yeah sure anything. sure um compared to all of the 2017 footage you can i think that distilled in that is i think what the vibe was supposed to be because you You're had right. all those like great shots of her um with that eye makeup on just kind of talking like an old diva you're right <laughs> about yeah. her life yeah i yeah i think probably the 2017 footage was the vibe they were going for and yes. then because of the pandemic it just fell off and it's so but it does kind of feel like it felt it felt like this kind of fabulous behind the scenes portrait of her at first but yeah it just and when are something. we getting the concert tour videos like yeah. like i like i need those where are they at where are they at girl anyway bye bye Thank you.